For those of you who don't know, on my Patreon page I have several different tiers of support levels where people can uh, contribute monthly donations to this channel, and one of the top tiers allows people to ask questions that I will answer in a Patreon video. Questions were asked, now a video is being videoed. Luis on Suarez asked, have you by chance already covered the Event Horizon Telescope Array? And if not, what are your thoughts on the findings? Somehow I have not covered this project, and it's a fascinating project for a whole bunch of different reasons. Like, most people don't realize this, but we've never actually seen a black hole. It's still kind of theoretical. Einstein first proposed the idea for a black hole a long time ago, based off of his equations and relativity and all that kind of stuff. And then we started seeing, you know, indirect references to them and the way that the gravitation of things get affected by things that we can't see, but we've never actually seen one. And this is the point of the Event Horizon Telescope, although it probably shouldn't be called a telescope because it's multiple telescopes. The general idea is the only way that they could actually define the event horizon of a black hole, obviously you can't see the black hole because all the light escapes it, but you can see the event horizon, the border of the black hole. But the only way that they can do that is with a telescope that's the size of the entire planet. So they've kind of turned the planet into a giant telescope. The Event Horizon Telescope Project combines telescopes from all around the world to focus on Sagittarius A, which is the name of the black hole, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It's the most well-known one. It's probably the closest one. And the way I describe it is it's kind of like the way a traditional telescope uses a big mirror, a parabolic mirror, to focus all of its points to one particular place where the sensor picks up on everything. That's basically what they're trying to do here, and that just involves a lot of synchronization and a lot of coordination between all these different telescopes around the world, of which there are nearly a dozen now. And because it's collecting so much information, they can't just, you know, email the information to each other. They can't just transmit it over the internet. They have to collect it on hard drives and then transport those hard drives to a central place where they combine all this information and try to create a picture out of it. Now the latest update from the Event Horizon team uh, was back in May and they're still basically trying to put all of the uh, information together. They most recently got one from a telescope at the South Pole only in December of last year. They're still trying to crunch all, these, all this information. They're still trying to put a picture together. Nothing has been put out yet, but they're thinking toward the end of this year they're going to have some preliminary images. They're probably going to be really rough, might not really amount to anything, but it's going to be really exciting to see what they come up with. And when they do, yes, I will probably do a video about that. Michael Wade asked if I could do a video about radiation during interplanetary travel. Yeah, with all the hoopla about us getting ready to start going to Mars, sending humans to Mars, this is a, a really huge issue. As most of you already know, we are protected from not just solar radiation, but also cosmic rays, galactic cosmic rays that come from outside of our solar system because of our uh, magnetic field here on Earth and our thick atmosphere. But when you're uh, traveling out to Mars, which is going to take a good 500 days or something like that just to get there, and then the time to get back, and then the you know, radiation that you're actually going to be exposed to on Mars, um, this is something that could increase your risk for severe cancers by fivefold. By fivefold? Sure, I'll go with it. The amount of radiation they would receive is the same as getting a full body CAT scan every six days. Not a good thing. Now there are lots of different ways to try to protect them. Obviously there's the lining of the spaceships that they would be on. Problem is you can't just line a spaceship with say lead or something like that. You've got to keep the weight down as far as possible. Water actually is a good absorber of radiation. And there's also talk of just putting up some kind of shield between the ship and the sun to keep all of the solar radiation from, from blocking them. Or not from blocking them, to block the solar radiation from hitting them. I can talk. And this is such a problem that NASA actually kind of tried to crowdsource a solution to this. Back in 2015, they did a contest to submit uh, solutions for you know protecting uh, astronauts from radiation, and they picked five winners. And some of them were the kind of things that I just talked about. The water-lined suits, water-lined spacecraft, uh, shields that can protect them. Some proposed electromagnetic devices that could create uh, magnetic fields around the spacecraft, just like what we have on Earth. One talked about a magnetic array that would surround the spacecraft to deflect any radiation. These are all really interesting ideas. We'll be hearing more about this in the coming years as NASA starts to prepare to go back to the moon and go out to Mars. This is going to be one of the biggest challenges that they're going to have to face and that they're going to have to have an answer for. Mac asked, one thing I've always wondered is how do they keep track of all the stars in the sky? Is there a database that has them listed with names? And if so, who owns that? 
I want to thank Mac for this question because I read it and I was like, oh, that's an easy answer. I'll just Google that real quick. <laughs> it wasn't an easy answer. Actually, the easy answer is that there's not just one star catalog out there. There's multiple star catalogs out there, and there have been multiple star catalogs going all the way back to ancient Greece. Actually, I just made the mistake of making ancient Greece like the oldest thing of all time. Actually, it was, went all the way back to ancient Babylonians. Take that, ancient Greece. But now I'll put a link to a list of the different star catalogs down below, but there are multiple of them, and actually the names of many of the stars that you find are actually named after the catalog that you can find them in. But two of the most popular ones are the Hipparchus star catalog and the Gaia star catalog. But yeah, there's many more. Uh, nobody, owns all the, nobody owns all the stars in the sky, no matter what some billionaire wants to tell you. But yeah, I'll put a link to that down in the description. Phil asks, can you do a video of the technologies that spaceflight has given us? I actually love this topic, and I did a video about this a long time ago, talking about some of the biggest, um, they call them spin-off technologies that NASA develops over the years. The reason why I love this topic is because it, it kind of puts the smack down on anybody that says that space travel is a big waste of money, that there are bigger problems here at home, that we could spend that money here at home in ways that would benefit humanity better. Uh, this, I think, disproves that. Because space travel is such a unique and extreme thing to do. You try to get up there and you try to perform work and try to live in space, you just find one issue after another that you have to figure out some kind of creative solution for. And some of these creative solutions wind up being things that completely change our lives here on Earth. And this is why I kind of get on my high horse when people start kind of dissing on science or especially like, you know, your flat earthers and stuff like that. I'm always like, look, if you, if you hate science, you don't get to use a cell phone. You don't get to use the internet. I could go on and on and on. Because it was only through the act of science that maybe had no other purpose whatsoever than the very act of doing science that made these things possible and have made our world the way it is today. But yeah, I mean, just some of the examples that I could point to are camera phones, the tiny camera lenses that are used in phones were actually first developed for lightweight cameras that could be used in space travel. Scratch resistant lenses for glasses first came from the coatings they used in the glass on uh, space missions. The technology behind CAT scans were first developed up in space. The technology behind light emitting diodes, LED lights, which are completely taking over our world now, first invented up in space because they were very low wattage and they were very light and easy to use. There are water purification systems saving lives in developing nations right now that were first developed on the International Space Station. Wireless headsets use technology that was first developed for astronauts doing EVA uh, walks in space. Memory foam first came from space. Ear thermometers first came from space uh, technologies. Dust busters were built around the stuff that they used to collect samples on the moon. The list goes on and on, and like I said, I've covered some of these in a previous video. I'll link to it right up here, but um, yeah, space technology and the space exploration has always had some secondary benefit to the world that's actually much bigger than the original intent that it was developed for. And for that reason, I'm always very pro space flight. And Paul Kios asks, tribalism, you've mentioned it a few times in your other videos, but I don't think you've done a video about it. Yeah, I've touched on tribalism here and there, and that's probably all I can do uh, for this video as well. But tribalism is something that we're really starting to see um, exacerbated in our social media environment these days. I've heard somebody say that one of the big problems in the world today is that we are a tribal species trying to be a global species. You know, this kind of thing is hardwired into us from, from back in the day when it was a survival tactic. Knowing who was in your tribe, who was safe, who was uh, a danger to you, that was very important stuff. Your life depended on it. And it could even be argued that the warfare that came out of tribalism, whether it's nationalism or tribalism or whatever, even had some uh, benefits to technology. There was always some kind of new technology that came out of warfare. But we're kind of entering a whole new era now where like traditional wars aren't really a thing anymore. And so it seems like the best thing that we can do as a species, as a people, is to kind of break through those tribal barriers and, and come together. But it's so hardwired into our, our psyches that I don't know how exactly we get there. And yeah, the social media environment that we live in is algorithmically designed to reward and incentivize extremist thought, extremist behavior. People, you know, when they see something that heightens their emotion, they're gonna react to it, and that's gonna make it promote more with these algorithms. And there's a big argument to be had there about just how dangerous this is in the long run. 
But no, tribalism is a huge topic, and it's something that's really going to affect our species going forward. So uh, I'm actually going to point... There's a, a link I'll put down in the description to a podcast that I absolutely love. It's called You Are Not So Smart. They talk about things like this all the time in terms of just how our psyches work and our psychology. And there's a really great one on tribalism that um, I will recommend for anybody to listen to. It's, it's going to cover it in way more detail than I could right here. But yeah, I'll put that link downstairs. So yeah, this is a quick sort of semi-lightning round thing, just covering the questions from my Patreon supporters. I love my Patreon supporters. You guys have really uh, stepped up and made me feel really good lately. I, I had some things that were kind of bothering me and, and my, my, my tribe and uh, Patreon came up and helped me out. Really do appreciate you guys so much. But hopefully some of those questions cover things that maybe you hadn't thought about before, maybe something you would like to look more into. Again, I'll put some links down in the description. If so, then I did my job today. Please like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, this is not a typical kind of video, but you can go check out some of my others, and if you like those, please do subscribe. I come out with videos every Monday and every Thursday. Until next time, you guys have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys, take care.